In this episode of Climate Gem, I'm talking to Professor Catherine Hayhoe, a very well-known climate scientist who's been covering the COPs and participating in the discussions of, since Paris. And we talk about how effective the Paris Agreement has been, how policy here is made, and whether pledges are kept and what happens to them. And are the public right to develop this sense of cynicism about what's going on, or should we all be more optimistic about what's happening behind the scenes? Catherine, it's great to see you. I want to just start, jump right in really, a, a lot of what I've heard you talking about is, is this rhetoric around 1.5 degrees C is now slipping away. Governments don't appear to be interested. Uh, is the 1.5 degree C framing going to die, do you think? There's been a lot of discussion about exactly that all week because we're getting closer and closer to the threshold that's needed to reduce emissions to the level that could ensure that we meet that goal. And as many businesses and organizations say, who've just signed a statement to this effect, it is a limit, not a goal. We don't want to go beyond it. We want to be below it. If we scientists could set a target, our target would be zero. The reason it isn't zero is because there's no magic switch to turn everything off. We also know, and the science is clear, that every bit of warming matters. So eight years ago, before the Paris Agreement, we were headed to a four to five degrees Celsius warmer world by the end of the century. Four to five degrees. Now, according to the latest analyses and what countries have promised, we're headed to a world that is probably somewhere around two and a half degrees warmer than it was in the past. That's still too much, but it's a lot better than we had eight years ago. So we need to do as much as we can, as hard as we can, and if we do everything we can to meet 1.5, and instead we get to 1.6 instead, that's a lot better than if we just say, oh, let's just aim for two instead, and we end up at two and a half, which is where we are today. So it really is a case of as much as possible, as soon as possible. Okay. You stated on social media recently that you're pretty fed up with people being branded a failure before it started, but it's all a waste of time sort of thing. But if you think that about the, the history of the COP's narrative, it, it keeps evolving from one agreement, like the Paris Agreement, mm -hmm. to another without any serious impact on actual global emissions that we've seen so far. Are we saving these planetary boundaries or are we grappling with a debate that's kind of no longer influencing the final outcome? Mm -hmm. When you look at what's happening at the global scale, you don't see what's happening at the regional scale. So countries like Sweden have already reduced their emissions significantly compared to what they were. There are policies in place around the world, such as carbon pricing in Canada and Chile, electric car policies in Norway and China. There are so many policies in place that are already being activated that are changing emissions. But what's happening is we had been increasing our carbon emissions exponentially. And so the first step is to slow down the rise. That's what's happening right now. The next step is to stop the rise. That has to happen as soon as possible. And then the step that we've all been waiting for is to turn down the emissions until eventually we reach zero. And people want it to be zero immediately, but unfortunately, that seems to be beyond the capacity of most of us. So instead, we need to do as much as we can, as soon as we can, and we need to celebrate what's already happening. That's the first, the, the first side of the coin, but we also have to share the risks that are not being avoided if we don't do more. That's the other side of the coin. Yeah, it strikes me as pointing that for years, loss and damage was a fringe issue because the focus was on the NDCs and 1.5 degrees. Oh, yeah. Now that it's shifting and loss and damage is entering the negotiations, mm -hmm. and th these seem like shifting sands because suddenly 1.5 doesn't sort of want to be center stage anymore. And can you really expect any solid policy to be enacted from this kind of approach when we, we can't stick to one, but we move to another? So I was at the Paris COP. Yeah. And what struck me the most was that while all the countries in the world were there to negotiate emission reductions, to keep global temperature below at least two degrees and one and a half if possible, most countries there had almost no emissions to reduce. The vast majority of countries at Paris were there to simply say, look what's happening in our country. We've done almost nothing to cause the problem. Here are all the impacts that are happening. So that struck me immediately years ago. And now here we are with a signed Paris agreement four specific targets that was finalized last year in Glasgow. Glasgow was actually to finalize Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. So now it's signed. 
And that's why the attention has transitioned to loss and damage, which to be completely honest, is much more relevant to a large number of countries around the world than emission reductions. Yeah. It isn't that they're shifting the attention, it's that the Paris Agreement is a done deal. It's finished. Like it's signed. But like there's we, no more negotiations. But if we stop aiming for limiting warming to 1.5, then we're kind of, the, the Paris Agreement becomes something that we never actually achieve. Right. Well, the, the wording of the Paris Agreement says below two degrees yeah. and one and a half if possible. I know. I'm thinking of the, the, those people who don't emit anything in the global south who really needed that 1.5 to, to, to work. And so I've always kind of used that as, the, as what, what our real intention is. Um, yes. And in the UK, on the regional level, they're signing off more licensing for, for drilling in the North Sea and just to narrowly avoided some fracking <laughs> ambitions. The point I'm trying to make is our rhetoric here and the things we're really trying to get done, mm -hmm. are they intricately connected to what's really happening? in terms of the efforts to reduce emissions? Well, yeah, I think this is what I would say. So tackling climate change is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is a better future, but we will not get a better future if we don't fix climate change. That better future will not exist for the UK, for North America, or for all the countries who are so concerned about loss and damage here. The only path to a better future is by reducing our emissions as much as possible, as soon as possible. And for many countries, they already realize that. The problem is they don't have a lot of emissions to reduce. Mm -hmm. So that's why these meetings are so important because those countries, which make up the majority of countries in the world, are here to talk to the minority of countries who are the high emitters and the wealthiest countries in the world also about the urgency of action. Yeah. Yeah. There's recent research in Europe and the UK that I was sent recently, and, and it, it demonstrates that people are aware that people care mm -hmm. a great deal, mm -hmm. and yes. people are not that hopeful about the future. No. And this creates a sort of cynicism, and it seems to be spreading when I talk to people who aren't particularly engaged in the whole thing. They, they look at it as a cynical thing yes. that they know they should be worried about, but they're not. Yes. Cynicism is spreading among those people at home watching what is going on here. What would you say to those people who are kind of think this is a, a sideshow to what we can't actually do? So I, as a climate scientist, and many of my other colleagues who are climate scientists, are sincerely worried about the rise of cynicism and doomerism. The idea that it's too late, the cake is baked, there's nothing we can do. Because we know that if we decide there's nothing we can do, then we will do nothing and we are doomed. But nothing could be further from the truth because I study future climate change. I actually run the models and the scenarios. I look at their impact on water and food and infrastructure and health. And I know that our future is in our hands. And the only thing that will get us to a better future is if we act. And we still have the ability to do so. So for many years, I speak to people all the time. I give almost 100 virtual presentations a year and many in person as well. And when people ask me questions, I was hearing the same question again and again. And that question is, what gives you hope? The reason why people ask that question is because we're worried. The vast majority of people are already worried about climate change. I live in the United States where 70% of people are already worried. 83% of mothers are worried. 86% of young people are worried. The numbers are higher in Canada, the UK, Australia, the EU. We're worried, but we're not activated. Only a tiny percentage are activated. So why are we worried? We're worried because all of the headlines are negative. If you look at all the headlines on climate change, they are frustrating, they make you feel anxious, they make you feel despairing, they make you feel paralyzed or overwhelmed or guilty. All the headlines are negative because that's what makes us click. Yeah. And we have to understand the climate risks, but if we only communicate the risks without the rewards of action, nobody knows what to do. In the United States, 50% of people feel hopeless and helpless and don't know where to start. So when we see that people aren't acting, we often think they need more doom-filled messaging to act. And so we pile on more information about polar bears and ice sheets and sea level rise and droughts. And that just paralyzes them even more. Because what they're lacking is not awareness of the risks. Yeah. What they're lacking is a sense of efficacy. They don't know how they can make a difference. As one woman said when I heard her after I'd given a talk, she was walking out of the building and she was talking to a friend. She said, I've always been worried about climate change, but I didn't know what to do. 
So I did nothing. And I think that kind of sums up most people's perspectives. But what I had done is I had talked about all of the things that we can do and how we can use our voice to advocate for change. And one of the things I'd mentioned was food waste. So she said, it was just after Christmas. She said, now I know that we can eat the Christmas leftovers and that's how I'll start. And that's key. We just need to take that first step of action and realize that we can do something that makes a difference. And that is what we do not hear about in the news. And we do not hear about all the good news of all the solutions that are happening around the world. We need a balanced approach that shares the risks of inaction, but couples them with the rewards of action. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually do agree with you. I know you and do. There's been, <laughs> there's been a lot of talk recently about hope founded in realism and action, but we're still failing and powerful forces appear to love the status quo. We get people talk about the size of the fossil fuel lobby at COP mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. This kind of touches on what you just said. When I speak to a lot of people around Europe, they're talking about, you know, very final, you know, we're not having kids, we're not doing this, we're not doing that. And a part of the idea that we're at a junction, we're not at the end of the road, and we've got to get across that. But to do it, and I'm just, this is reflecting on what you've been saying, is, mm -hmm. is that we need a sort of moderate mass movement. And at yeah. the moment, we seem to have a fraction of that. And until we get that moderate mass movement, we're going to keep getting people throwing soup cans of, of paintings, you know, the, the extreme mm -hmm. who are trying to warn the masses. Doing their best, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whether yeah. you agree with it or not, yeah. they are trying to warn the masses. Uh -huh. It's like the system talking to itself. And somehow, I mean, do you have an, a system intervention? <laughs> oh, we get a knighthood or whatever the equivalent is, if you can get this. A system intervention that could accelerate that process. I do. Oh, gosh. And you know what my system intervention is. What is it? It is something so simple that we're not doing it. We aren't talking about it. And if you don't talk about it, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you ever do anything about it? So I'm not talking about science because people say, well, I'm not a scientist. How am I supposed to talk about it? I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about everything we have in our head. I'm talking about connecting the issue to our hearts and to our hands. So in other words, what do we care about? Have a conversation with people who care about the same things as we care about. And then what can we do? Have a conversation with people where we work about what another organization did that we should do too. The place where we study or teach, what another organization did that we should do too. The city where we live, that city is doing that, we should do that too. How does social change begin other than when someone uses their voice to call for that change? Okay. And let me, so I can expand on that too. I'll go on then. So this concept dawned on me when I was looking at a photograph that George Marshall posted on Instagram. So George Marshall, of course, founded the Climate Outreach Organization, which is a great organization. It's all about having conversations about climate change. But the photo that he posted had nothing to do with talking about climate change or anything professional. In the summer, he likes to bike around to small villages and take pictures. And he posted a picture of a memorial plaque in a small church that he visited of a member of parliament who voted for the Anti-Slavery Act in the UK for over 25 years. And finally it was passed and he died. And the way that that memorial plaque was written showed what a long, hard walk it is to get something to actually change. And when you try again and again and again and you fail and it fails and it fails and the people in power won't listen to you and they won't support it and they won't vote for you. And then finally it happens. And the most interesting thing to me was the name of that member of parliament was someone who I've never heard before. I had never heard his name before. It was never anything that I had heard connected with the anti-slavery movement. And it made me realize how many thousands of men and women and children have there been in the world who have used their voices to call for action, who have persisted again and again in the face of failure, who have ultimately succeeded, and we walk today in the shadow of their actions, yeah. yet we don't know their names. Yeah, yeah. They changed the world, and if they did it, we can too. Absolutely. And the more of us that talk about it, we get better at articulating it. Yes. And then that, that's how we make action. And then let me tell you another story too, on. actually. So um, I was talking to a woman just a few months ago who had just read my book. And she wanted to tell me how my book had changed her life. It's a book called Saving Us. Yep. And it's about, really, it's not about saving the planet. It's about saving us, us humans and every living thing on this planet. That's what's at risk. Yeah, absolutely. The planet will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. So she said, you know, she had always lived very sustainably. She ate a plant-based diet, drove a plug-in car, had solar panels, did everything right to reduce her personal carbon footprint. But until she read my book, she didn't realize that she was missing out on the biggest piece. 
the multiplicative effect. How did she move beyond her carbon footprint to her climate shadow? She wasn't talking about it. Yeah. She was a passionate gardener and she had many friends who gardened as well. And she cared about climate change because she was a gardener, but she had never shared that with any of her friends. And so when she realized that was the missing piece because she'd been feeling hopeless and frustrated and you know, like everything she's doing is not enough. She started to talk with all of her gardening friends about, again, not so much the head, but the heart, yeah. why it mattered to her and therefore why it would matter to them because they were gardeners too. And what she was doing about it to make a difference. That is the missing piece. Points of common interest. Yes. Away from science sometimes. Yes, definitely <laughs> away from science. No question about that. Well, look, thank you very much. It's been great to speak to you. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the rest of the, this mammoth conference. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs>